Hi, so welcome everyone to today's session of Michael Talks. So I'm Geraldine Butler and I'll be chairing this session together with Neil Gow, who you'll meet in a few moments. We're going to have two wonderful talks today from Leah Cowan and Ilian Ilyev. So just to remind you that the uh, Michael Talks uh, originated from the University of, of Exeter and the goal is um, to represent as many mycology speakers as possible to represent various career stages, gender, geography, fields. And we're going to have two 30 minute talks today. And after the talks, we'll have the question and answer session. So please remember to submit any questions that you have through the Q&A button, which you should see at the bottom of the screen. And you can submit those at any time. We will ask as many of those questions as we can, but please keep in mind that we may not be able to ask all of them and we may not ask them in the order in which they have been posed. So we will try and combine some questions um, and ask as many as possible. For those of you who want to look over the talk again, if any of your lab members who have missed it, the talks will be available on the MRC YouTube channel, so you can find them there at any time. So we have several more upcoming sessions. The next ones in May will feature Neil and Floyd Wormley, and then in June, Julian Naglick and Elaine Bignall. And please remember that you have to res register for each se session individually. So please rem uh, remind all your lab talks, all your lab members to do so. And for those of you who are at a re relatively early stage in your career, you might be interested in the Medical Mycology Trainee Seminar Series. So this features students, postdocs, clinical trainees, and some new faculty. Uh, they meet every second Thursday of the month at slightly variable times. And if you're interested in getting involved in this, please uh, look at the website there. So it's bit.ly forward slash MMTSS. And hopefully um, we'll see you uh, getting involved there. Okay, so with no Further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Professor Leia Cowan. So Leia is currently the Associate Vice President of Research at the University of Toronto, where she's been the full professor since 2016. So I'm sure you're all very familiar with her group's work. She's had a major impact applying functional and chemical genomics approaches to candida biology, particularly in relation to drug resistance and disease. She's been the recipient of numerous awards for both academic and applied aspects of her work. And we are very much looking forward to hearing our presentation today. So over to you, Leah. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Geraldine. And thank you uh, to all of those who've been involved in organizing this wonderful event, which has been really transformative for the field. So I'm absolutely delighted to have the opportunity to tell you a little bit about some of our recent work on identifying vulnerabilities in fungal pathogens through functional and uh, chemical genomic analyses. And to start, I think this myco audience is already well aware, but to place this in context, fungal pathogens have a, a devastating impact on human health worldwide. They infect billions and kill 1.5 million people every year, which is at least as many as tuberculosis or malaria. Fungal infections are, of course, on the rise due to the growing population of individuals with compromised immune function, and mortality rates often exceed 50%, with 90% of deaths due to a fairly limited number of species, including representatives of Candida species, Cryptococcus species, as well as Aspergillus. So one of the reasons why mortality rates are so high is that there's a real paucity of effective antifungal drugs that can be used to treat invasive fungal infections. There are only three classes of antifungal drugs that can be used in this context. On the left, you'll see the azoles, which are widely used in the clinic, and they're also widely used in agricultural contexts, which presents an interesting challenge. The azoles work by blocking the biosynthesis of a key membrane sterol, uh, ergosterol. This leads to the accumulation of an altered sterol, which causes uh, membrane stress and is static causing growth arrest rather than killing the fungal cell, which can lead to the evolution of resistance. The polyenes have been around for decades. They work by a sterile sponge mechanism and extract ergosterol from membranes. They have broad spectrum of activity, but are, are quite toxic due to effects on cholesterol in the mammalian cell. The echinocandins are the only new class to reach the clinic in decades, and they work by blocking the biosynthesis of a key cell wall linker molecule. A major liability with the echinocandins is that they have a limited activity spectrum and have no clinical efficacy against cryptococcus species. 
So as I alluded to earlier, resistance uh, is a major problem. It's emerged in a clinic to each class of antifungal drug and now presents a major impediment to treatment. And we have multi-drug resistant pathogens like Candida auris, which now present a growing threat. So we think a lot about new strategies to expand the antifungal target space. And I'm gonna highlight sort of the way in which we approach this and give you some neat vignettes or examples of, of stories that have emerged through these different kinds of approaches. So one uh, general strategy is functional genomics to identify vulnerabilities in Candida albicans we'll, we'll showcase here as one of our work work organisms in the lab. So we use functional genomics to identify essential genes. Uh, essential genes uh, encode essential uh, proteins typically, and, and these uh, are the most classic type of antifungal drug targets, most in clinical use, target essential proteins, examples being azoles targeting ERG-11 and echinocandins targeting FKS1. So we'll come back to our uh, resources for studying essential genes, but we're also very interested in identifying genes that are important for drug resistance, as well as genes that are important uh, for virulence traits and genes that are important directly for commensalism and uh, virulence. And we have all kinds of different studies in these different areas. So we're going to look first at the essential gene uh, context in Candida albicans. So we know this organism has about 6,600 genes in the diploid genome. Uh, about 40% of these lack identifiable uh, homologs in the model yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is one of the best characterized eukaryotic genomes and as such has been a real reference point for annotating C. albicans gene function. So that means for 40% of genes, we, we can't use this as a, as a way in which to infer function. We also note that predictive value of gene essentiality for those genes with a clear homolog in cerevisiae is only 52%. So it tells us we can learn a lot from cerevisiae, but really we need to define the essential gene set directly in the organism of interest. Essentiality has been explored uh, to an initial extent with the transposon mutant collection uh, generated in a haploid C. albicans mutant background, which provides some interesting context for analysis of what happens in the actual diploid state. So the way in which we've approached analysis of gene essentiality is using a conditional uh, gene replacement and conditional expression or GRACE uh, strategy. So in this strategy, you can see illustrated on the bottom left, if we have a diploid genome with two alleles of a target gene, we replace one allele uh, with a selectable marker flanked by two unique barcodes that lets us do all kinds of very powerful pooled experiments where we can quantify the relative abundance of each strain using a barcode sequencing based output. That gives us a heterozygous mutant state. And what we can then do is replace the native promoter of the remaining allele with a tetracycline repressible promoter that allows us to turn off transcription of the gene and look at loss of function phenotypes. So we have a, an outstanding team that's come together to, to figure out sort of gene essentiality in C. albicans. We have a computational team at the University of Minnesota with Chad Myers and Shang Zhang. We've had uh, excellent additional computational support from the O'Meara's at the University of Michigan. And those without an affiliation listed are all in my team at the University of Toronto and have done phenomenal work to build out the largest functional genomic resource and really dig into the gene essentiality problem. So we approach this by building and leveraging a machine learning model to predict C. albicans essential genes so that we could have a sort of a smarter strategy for engineering our mutants. As input features to our model, uh, we had a number of categories, including, as you'll see on the left, gene expression data sets, where we looked at median gene expression level, gene expression variance, and degree of co-expression. We also looked at sequence features like codon adaptation index, sequence variation, uh, as well as data from Cerevisiae. So for those genes with an ortholog, was the ortholog essential? If there was a some sort of a set of paralogs in Cerevisiae as a result of the genome duplication, were those paralogs synthetic lethal? We could also leverage a number of features from the transposon uh, mutant data set uh, generated by Judy Berman's lab. So we were able to then uh, build a model uh, and train this model using an initial set of these GRACE or gene replacement and conditional expression strains, a set of 2,300 of those. So from this, we'd already defined that there was 523 that were essential and approximately 1,800 that were non-essential. We used all these input features and this training data to, to build the model. It was a random forest model, and then ultimately generate predictions for all 6,600 uh, genes annotated in the genome. 
to then test the model, we engineered an additional uh, 866 new mutants. We've now identified from that set 998 that are essential. So 98 essentials and 768 non-essentials. So altogether, when we look at our data, uh, we found that the model was, was very powerful at predicting essential genes. We were able to identify 621 C. albicans essential genes. 149 of these lacked a human homologue, which is very useful from a drug development point of view, and four of which also lacked a homologue in the Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which then suggests there's potentially more uh, new biology to figure out. And we've used this approach to really define new gene function. We figured out new members of kinetochore complexes. We've figured out uh, new genes involved in mitochondrial function as well as translation initiation. But rather than a deep dive into the gene function characterization, what I'm gonna do here is now think about uh, our overall goal. So we wanted to identify essential genes to be able to then step back and say, could we use these as potential targets uh, for new molecules that might have potential as leads for drug development. So a complementary approach I'm just gonna introduce you to is, is instead of a genetics forward approach would be a, a small molecule forward approach. So leveraging chemical genomics to identify compounds and their targets for drug development. So we have a number of strategies in this space. So one would be of course, screening large compound collections where we can identify new and interesting bioactive molecules. There's all kinds of interesting collections out there including natural products and synthetic scaffolds that we can leverage for these purposes. And we can do screens with or without the presence uh, of an existing antifungal if we wanna look at combinations or at single agent activity. The key challenge when we find interesting bioactives is figuring out what those molecules do. And so one way we do that is with uh, chemical genomic profiling where we profile uh, large mutant collections and we look for genes for which reduced dosage confers hypersensitivity to the molecule as you see here with the schematic with the blue circle being uh, the gene product. We reduce dosage and we confer hypersensitivity to a molecule that targets that gene product. We can also look uh, for resistant mutants and do genome sequencing to identify mutations that might draw, block the drug binding. And once we have targets, we have a very vibrant structure enabled drug design program that we use uh, readily to sort of advance, improve leads with fungal you know, potency and selectivity as key priorities. So to connect back with the essential gene story, we wanted to find molecules that might target a C. albicans essential gene product. We screened a library of 10,000 compounds from the University of Tokyo's core chemical library and identified one molecule that had a really interesting and potent single agent activity against C. albicans. You can see uh, the molecule here uh, as shown and you can see sort of a heat map format for candida albicans, candidorus and candida gulbrata. In green is growth and black is no growth. So you can see this particular compound, uh, NPBTA, inhibits growth most potently of C. albicans with some activity against Oris and Glabrata as well. So to figure out the target, we screened a library of C. albicans heterozygous double barcoded deletion mutants covering about 90% of the genome and identified uh, a single mutant that was most uh, hypersensitive. And so this was a, a mutant that was hypersensitive for GLN4, which encodes a glutaminal tRNA synthetase required to add glutamine to its cognate tRNA. So we then wanted to validate uh, this dosage relationship. So here we show genetic validation that reducing the dosage of GLN4 conserves hypersensitivity to this compound. The original name has this T nomenclature uh, now christened NPBTA. So what you can see here is with the wild type adding uh, doxycycline has no effect on sensitivity, but with our TET O GLN4 strain, it actually overexpresses GLN4 in the absence of tetracycline, conferring slight increase in resistance. And when we add tetracycline or doxycycline, we reduce levels of GLN4 and confer hypersensitivity. So the flip side is selecting for resistant mutants. We did so uh, and did sequencing on three of those and all three had mutations in GLN4 in the catalytic domain consistent with this being a putative target. We've confirmed that NPBTA also inhibits translation in C. albicans, and we've been able to then leverage a, a homology model for a crystal structure of GLN4 to really show how the compound is likely to engage uh, with the target. We've been able to map on where our resistance conferring amino acid substitutions likely lie in terms of modulating binding affinity for the compound. So we think this is a really neat story of how we can go from screening molecules to identifying targets uh, with essential genes as the core focus.
So moving from Cialbicans, I'm going to give you another brief vignette for Candida auris, which is a multi-drug resistant Candida species uh, that's causing major issues in hospitals and with uh, immunosuppressed patient populations. So here we screened a library of 2,500 molecules from a diverse collection of natural product inspired uh, chemicals and identified six with fairly potent antifungal activity. So what you're looking at here is a plot of the percent inhibition. And so those red dots are the molecules that were the most potent in terms of antifungal activity. You can see here the heat map format, looking at dose response to those compounds. And what was quite interesting is the five most potent compounds from the screen were all rocaglates. Rocaglates are a chemical class that's known to be derived from aglaea species. And these mahogany trees are known to produce these compounds to prevent insect infestation, suggesting quite a broad mode of action. So rocaglates have been investigated uh, in the context of anti-cancer activity, and they've been shown to have this activity via inhibition of translation initiation via the RNA helicase EIF4A. So this was sort of a, a smoking gun that we could see if indeed the compounds were exhibiting antifungal activity also by inhibiting translation initiation. So to test this, uh, we were able to use a fluorescent translation assay that allows us to observe protein synthesis upon treatment uh, or in the absence of treatment based on incorporation of a fluorescent methionine analog. So what you can see in an untreated condition, uh, the cells have active translation and they're green. If we treat Candida auris with a, a known translation inhibitor cyclohexamide, we block translation, we see no more fluorescent signal. And all five of our rocaglates did the same thing where they blocked uh, translation and we no longer had any, any signal of methionine incorporation. What was kind of interesting was that Candida albicans was completely resistant to the rocaglate. So there was no growth inhibition and consistent with that, there was no inhibition of translation, uh, as you can see by the continued green uh, state of the cells, even despite rocaglate treatment. So it was neat was we were able to map this down, uh, the difference in the species response to the rocaglates to a single amino acid residue. So it was simply uh, the residue at position 153, which was divergent between C. auris uh, and C. albicans. And we were able to demonstrate that just simply changing that residue could swap uh, the sensitivity of the species to the rocaglates. So what you can see here is wild type C. albicans, as you'll note, uh, is resistant uh, and translation persists despite rocaglate treatment. If we um, swap the allele uh, for the candida albicans strain for the C. auris allele, we now render the strain sensitive to rocaglate inhibition of translation. Wild type C. auris is sensitive by default. And if we swap in the C. albicans allele, you can see here we then uh, wind up with a resistant state. So down to a single residue. What's kind of interesting here is that even if we sensitize C. albicans to the rocaglates, and here you can see that set. So here's the sensitized C. albicans, uh, growth is inhibited, C. auris is sensitive by default, and here's the resistant uh, counterpart. What was quite neat is when we looked at whether those cells had different fates in their growth inhibited context, we found there was indeed a remarkable difference. So what you're looking at on the bottom here is when we simply spot the cells that were previously exposed uh, to the compound, this is now on rich medium with no compound, you can see the sensitive C. albicans and the C. auris respond very differently. So C. albicans can resume growth just fine. So the rocaglates have a sort of static mode of action for C. albicans, whereas for C. auris, we see uh, that the cells actually die upon exposure to the rocaglates. So even at equivalent, equivalent inhibitory concentrations, rocaglate-induced translation inhibition leads to very different cell fates in C. auris and C. albicans. I won't go through the whole story, but what I'm going to highlight here is that it was really neat. So for C. albicans, again, it just undergoes cell arrest. That's it. They can resume when the rocaglates are removed from their growth media. For Cioris, it activates a, a very specific cell death program. It's an unusual cell death program. We see a few key features of classic cell death programs. We see strong vacuolar fragmentation uh, and acidification. We see mitochondrial depolarization, and, and we see caspase uh, activation.
So what I'm going to do now is think uh, beyond uh, simply going after targeting sort of essential processes, uh, molecules with single agent activity, we think that identifying genes and molecules that modulate drug resistance is a really powerful strategy to expand the antifungal target space and really opens routes to combination therapies, which have become standard of care for bacterial infections, HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria, but have been less well explored for fungi. So I'm going to give you uh, a couple of super quick examples of this. Uh, and this first one is with Candida auris. And this was a screen of that same library of 2,500 compounds, this time to look for molecules that synergize with fluconazole and have potent azole uh, potentiating activity. So we identified a really neat molecule. We've christened it azofluxin uh, because it has an activity that involves azole efflux inhibition. So pretty neat, you inhibit the efflux transporter, uh, which I'll highlight in just a moment and lead to increased azole accumulation in the cell. So in terms of what a synergy might look like, uh, here's a plot of a checkerboard or dose response matrix. You can see we've increased the concentration of this compound now called azofluxin along the x-axis. We increase the concentration of fluconazole along the y-axis. Each compound alone has uh, actually quite negligible antifungal activity at these concentration ranges. But you can see together, they have incredibly potent synergistic activity. So really effective combination. We're able to show that azofluxin increases the intracellular levels of fluconazole and potentiates the activity of other intracellular acting compounds in a manner that depends on a single ABC transporter called CDR1, which is widely known in the field. We think this is a really uh, neat strategy uh, that has some therapeutic utility that we've already shown. So here you're looking at a combination of azofluxin and fluconazole and how it can rescue luciferase expressing human cells in co-culture. So in, in cell culture, we can infect uh, human cells and look at whether uh, our compound treatments can rescue viability when the cells are otherwise killed by candida. So we monitor luminescence to look at the human cell viability. The gray bars are the human cells alone, so none of our treatments are toxic. The blue bars are the co-culture when the human cells are infected with candida. You can see they're all killed when we don't treat or if we treat with just azofluxin or a low fluconazole dose. However, the combination of this low fluconazole and azofluxin completely rescues the human cells, equivalent to a very high dose of fluconazole. We were able to work with David Andes uh, in terms of a, a mouse model of systemic infection for Candida, Candida auris and found that azofluxin had really potent activity. So here you're looking at the log fungal burden. You can see the input untreated that increases dramatically. What you can see is azofluxin alone had a really interesting single agent activity that was unexpected based on our in vitro results. Fluconazole alone had some therapeutic benefit, and the combination was even more effective at treating the candida auris infections. So we think it's a, a really neat strategy, and there's still lots to explore uh, about targeting efflux uh, in these fungal pathogens. So here we're going to turn to uh, a slightly different approach rather than targeting efflux, but here's something we've been interested in for years, which is inhibition of stress response regulators as a strategy to abrogate drug resistance with broad therapeutic potential. So what you're looking at on the left is a Petri dish. There's an E-test with a concentration gradient of fluconazole, uh, a widely used azole with a gradient from high to low at the bottom. And the azole would diffuse into the media containing a, creating a gradient uh, of azole concentration. So what you'll note, this is candida albicans. Away from the E-test strip, you can see uh, actually it grows beautifully. And, and this strain is quite resistant to fluconazole, so it grows right up to the test strip. If we include on the right a stress response inhibitor in the medium, a fixed concentration throughout the whole agar petri dish, what you'll see is that away from the antifungal, away from the azole, there's no inhibition of growth because it's not a stressful growth environment. However, close uh, to the antifungal, you see this beautiful synergy where we rescue the activity of fluconazole against the drug-resistant isolate. So we found that inhibition of key stress response regulators is a really powerful strategy to abrogate resistance to all of the classes of antifungal drugs in each of the, the leading fungal pathogens of humans. And I note that this strategy makes a great deal of sense because many of the antifungals induce a state of cellular stress by impairing the cell membrane or cell wall homeostasis. And as such, these stress response regulators are critical for the fungus to resist or tolerate exposure to the compounds.
So we have a whole variety of programs now targeting multiple uh, stress response regulators. I'm gonna give you a, a one slide example of some of our work in this space targeting a molecular chaperone called HSP90. So this chaperone, a challenge is that it's conserved uh, in humans. So the key was really developing fungal selective uh, molecules. We assembled a great team. We've solved co-crystal structures of the chaperone uh, with a ligand here that has no fungal selectivity. And on the right, you can see co-crystal structure with a ligand that has about 25 fold fungal selectivity. And what you can see is that there's this conformational change that happens accompanying ligand binding. And using this strategy, we've been able to guide synthesis of over 300 analogs and have achieved over 200 fold fungal selectivity. So we've now uh, actually launched a startup company to advance this using a slightly different strategy, but again, going after fungal selective HSP90 inhibitors. So in the last couple of slides, I'm just going to highlight a really neat and different approach which focuses on targeting virulence factors to cripple fungal pathogens. So for candida albicans, one of the best known virulence factors is the ability to transition between yeast and filamentous growth. Yeast are critical for colonization and dissemination. Filaments are critical for invasion of organs and causing host damage. And we know that morphogenesis is induced by many host relevant cues including uh, internalization by host immune cells. So we've got all kinds of programs underway in the space to identify the genes that are crucial for the fungus to uh, induce filamentation in response to these different stimuli, as well as what are the factors within the macrophage that are relevant for inducing filamentation. But what I wanna show you here is a really neat way that we can mine the microbiome for new potential leads for, for drug development. So here's a really interesting finding. Others in the field have also reported that lactobacillus species, which are common residents of the microbiota, uh, often in common niches with candida albicans, they block C. albicans filamentation. So here's a control C. albicans condition where they're growing the cells in 10% serum, so they're filamenting. If we incubate a co-culture with lactobacillus, it blocks filamentation. If we simply uh, filter out the bacteria and have just conditioned medium, we can show here that we can still block filamentation consistent with this being mediated by uh, a secreted a small molecule. And we know that this happens with at least uh, nine different uh, commercial or industrial probiotic strains uh, that we've examined as well as broadly across lactobacillus isolates from nature. So we were able to engage in a sort of tour de force bioactivity guided fractionation effort and structural analysis by NMR to identify a single molecular entity in a bioactive fraction. And this molecular entity was one acetyl beta carboline. So beta carbolines are biogenic amines which modulate neurotransmitter activity in humans and they have very minimal toxicity to human cells. So quite an interesting scaffold for with great development potential. So we were able to uh, synthesize one acetobetocarboline as well as acquire it commercially and confirm that indeed uh, this molecule has very potent uh, inhibition of filamentation capacity and not only in response to one cue but in response to many, many different cues that induce C. albicans filamentation. We also know that the one acetyl beta carboline blocks biofilm formation. And we have really exciting data that this suggesting this should really be a great strategy in multiple different sort of in vivo contexts. So I'm not gonna go into the details here in light of time, but I can highlight through a tour de force effort, we were able to establish that one acetyl beta carboline seems to block C. albicans filamentation by inhibition of a DYRK kinase uh, called YAK1. So it's a, a really neat story on how we figured out the mechanism, but I'm gonna leave you with this sort of exciting idea that we've got a, a neat new compound that blocks the albicans filamentation with great uh, potential for optimization. And we now know the target and we have a uh, great ability to move forward with optimizing the scaffold. So to summarize then, hopefully I have shown you uh, a number of different uh, stories to emerge from our work, focusing on first uh, Candida albicans essential genes and how we've used a functional genomics approach to identify antifungal targets as with the GLN4 glutaminal tRNA synthetase as a target of a new potent antifungal NPVTA. We've also shown how translation inhibition by rocaglates activates a species-specific cell death program in Candida auris via inhibition of an essential EIF4A protein. I've shown you how development of fungal selective inhibitors of antifungal efflux and stress response provides a really powerful strategy to advance antifungal drug discovery. 
I've shown you how lactobacillus secreted uh, one acetobeta beta carboline inhibits the albicans filamentation via YAK1. And sort of more broadly, hopefully, we've uh, talked about how chemical genomic and functional genomic analyses provide a really powerful strategy to identify vulnerabilities in fungal pathogens that we can leverage to understand host pathogen interactions and to guide the development of novel therapeutic strategies. So I think we're right on time. So I want to end here by really thanking uh, our wonderful uh, funding sources that have been really crucial for enabling our work, as well as an incredible international team of collaborators who've been uh, absolutely essential at advancing many, many facets of our program. And of course, I'd like to thank uh, our incredible team who are a wonderful, wonderful and inspiring group to work with uh, and have done phenomenal work in, in many of these uh, diverse areas. So with that, I will thank you uh, very much for your attention. I will stop screen sharing. And I think my understanding is that we wind up having the other presentation and then a question period at the end. But I will turn it over to our wonderful hosts to take it from here. Thank you very much. Um, Leah, that was a fabulous presentation. You could be thinking about that and, and <clears throat> sending in your questions. Uh, please continue to do so. Um, I have the, now the great pleasure to introduce the second speaker in the Mycotox se session, Ilian Iliev. Ilian works at the Jill Roberts Institute for Research in Inflammatory Bowel Disease at Cornell, but he's actually worked as a scientist in five different countries during his career and in fact, he speaks five different languages. I do hope he chooses to present today's language in English. Ilian's lab specializes in studies of the interaction between the commensal microbiota and immune cells at mucosal surfaces. And he's focused on understanding the functional consequences of the fungal microbiota, its composition, and metabolism and evolution in host immunity. His lab develops a variety of methodologies, including computational and experimental approaches to study the role of the microbiota. And he does this in the context of early and later life on therapeutic interventions and during uh, special conditions, pathogenic conditions, such as inflammatory bowel disease, allergies, and immunodeficiencies, where we know that fungi can contribute to that. So a uh, very warm welcome, Ilian, and we very much look forward to your presentation. Neil, thank you for uh, that uh, introduction. It's uh, my uh, pleasure and it's a great honor to uh, present here at the Micro Talks. So uh, let me share my screen and my presentation here. So this first slide here doesn't need introduction in this audience, but it's rather uh, uh, basically showing that fungal infections are uh, very prevalent. And they're a highly prevalent a number of barrier surfaces of our body, and they can lead to uh, devastating uh, systemic fungal infections that end up with mortalities. But there is one part of the body, the lower gastrointestinal tract, uh, where fungi are uh, less prevalent. Uh, so about 10 years ago, we found that uh, uh, fungi are actually present there, although the fungal infections are not something that is studied at that site. And, uh, that's, uh, and, and that community is found in different orders of animals. Uh, we also found uh, that it's a rather a diverse community using uh, deep sequencing approaches. And that community in analogy with the microbiome field was called the gut uh, microbiome. So that opened uh, a lot of uh, questions uh, in, uh, related to the field of mucosal immunology, to the field of uh, microbial ecology, diseases with gastrointestinal uh, uh, manifestations, and so on. Uh, so in the lab, we uh, put together this overarching hypothesis that lifelong exposure to fungi in the gut would shape the whole immune repertoire and states of homeostasis and disease. Uh, so we have been investigating this in a few different areas, and we group that into different questions that we have been pursuing in the lab. So what are the mechanisms 
uh, responsible for fungal recognition in the gut in induction of uh, immunity to those organisms locally? Uh, is there a host immune memory to microbiota? Because fungi are immersed in this uh, substantial community of bacteria in the gut, are those uh, uh, transkingdom communities interact between each other? And uh, in diseases where uh, we and others have observed fungal component, but they're not infectious diseases in the sense that we, uh, we define infectious diseases as such. Uh, so is there, uh, is the, are those fungal components involved in immunity and inflammation? And uh, because uh, processes in the gut can affect uh, immunity and host physiology at the gut distal body sites, we have been investigating how, how gut, uh, distal, uh, gut, distal, gut distal effects of this uh, uh, of uh, immunity primed by the gut microbiota, a topic that we'll, I will cover uh, to some degree today. Uh, so uh, this is actually a summary of uh, with, with a, uh, of a collective effort of many groups that have been uh, sequencing and analyzing the fungal microbiota at different body sites. So what came together uh, is, a, uh, is a collective conclusion is that this community uh, is extremely responsive to pathophysiological conditions. And we and others that are focusing on uh, gastrointestinal microbiota and inflammatory bowel disease also uh, summarize uh, a few different findings that I'll put here into a good news. So uh, the fungal communities in the gut are less complex compared to the bacterial communities. So theoretically, it should be uh, faster and easier to explore than which turn out not to be true, actually. But the bad news are, is that those communities are less stable and quite variable. So if you want to pursue the causative relationship between gut microbiota and disease, uh, how can you do that when the microbiome is so variable between different studies and patient cohorts? So we postulated that uh, if microbiota structure changes and that has any meaning to host uh, immunity, it should be recorded. There should be some immunological memory uh, to those events. So what do we know about, uh, about antifungal immunity in those complex diseases of the gastrointestinal tract? Turns out not much. Uh, we know that there are uh, antibodies against fungal menon that develop in Crohn's disease patients and are marker of disease severity. Uh, so we explored immunogenetics of inflammatory bowel disease, focusing specifically on loss of function mutations. And we defined a mutation in the gene encoding from the, for the fractal kind receptor CX3CR1 that was associated with uh, loss of uh, decrease of antifungal uh, antibodies in uh, Crohn's disease patients that were homozygous for the two alleles of this gene. But there wasn't loss uh, of antibodies against uh, bacterial flagellin and other antigens that develop uh, 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 antibodies against other antigens that develop in this population of patients. This was very specific for those uh, antifungal ASCA antibodies. So to cut the long story short here, uh, we uh, basically map this gene to a population, a population of gut resident mononuclear phagocytes. So what does chemokine receptor has to do with fungal recognition in those cells? So we performed RNA-seq studies of different populations of gut resident phagocytes and found that the CX3CR1 positive population expressed multiple molecules involved uh, in the, the C-type uh, uh, lectin receptor pathways uh, involved in fungal sensing and signaling downstream. Uh, so, uh, also in a mouse model where we could use actually reporter for CX3CR1, uh, so you can see here those microphages in green, and reporter for Kenda albicans, uh, which was expressing RFP, we saw that those cells are the ones that uptake uh, fungi in vivo. And this is an entire intestinal villi. You see how many of those Kenda uh, uh, cells are ending up in those microphages. So uh, at that time, Irina Leonardi joined the lab and uh, she explored using conditional knockout strategies, uh, what happens if we knock out those cells or if you, we impair uh, C-type lectin signaling in those cells. And she found that we lost uh, uh, fungal antigen specific K17 responses uh, in mice if we knock out those cells. 
we also lost a lot of the antibodies that uh, I mentioned about. Uh, and uh, there is also microbiota dysbiosis if those cells are targeted. Uh, but uh, similar, uh, none of those uh, happened if we target other population of gut resident bona fide dendritic cells. Uh, she then in the lab explored uh, uh, how those cells would affect another process. So what we described was that gut fungal dysbiosis uh, is uh, affecting the severity of uh, uh, experimental lung allergy in mice. So she uh, uh, went after this model and knocked out the, this population of CX301 positive phagocytes or uh, CLR signaling this population of cells, specifically in the gut. And what he observed uh, was uh, that there was actually a decrease of t type 2 responses in the lung of those mice. And here I'm showing you one of multiple parameters. So. Uh, we started putting together uh, some pieces of the puzzle we have been actually going after. So what are the cellular networks that sense and respond to fungi in the gut? So at least one population of cells uh, emerges as a key, uh, key part of this network, uh, and it regulates local and gut distal effects of the microbiome during disease. At that time, Itai Duron in the lab was looking for methodology to estimate fungal biomass in the healthy human gut. So we, he found that uh, about 0.5 to 2% of the microbial uh, biomass that we find in the human feces is actually fungal. Okay, that was very surprising, and this can be uh, fungi coming from the food, it can be environmental fungi that end up in the gut, fungi from other body surfaces, and also gut commensal fungi. But nevertheless, that's a lot of fungal biomass to deal with. So uh, we know from, uh, from the studies of um, Susan Nobel, Richard Bennett, uh, uh, Bernie, uh, Bernie Hube, that, uh, gut, uh, that uh, Kenda, for example, can live in the human gut and can benefit from this environment as a commensal and pathobiont. But what uh, does uh, the host benefit from that? Uh, so what this gut microbiota is doing during the steady state? Is it a foe, is it a friend, or is that a neutral relationship? So we tied a uh, focus on this question uh, with the hypothesis that if uh, during the steady state, the immune system interacts with those fungi, and if that's a direct interaction, there should be T or B cell memory that develops. So he started exploring the host antibody pool against the gut microbiota, developing an assay that we called multi kintam antibody profiling. So in this assay, he uses uh, uh, we use fungal uh, antigens that are present in the feces and we pan uh, those with uh, a serum from the same host and look for antibody specificities. So this assay is different by uh, similar flow cytometry based assays uh, for the fungal, uh, for, for, uh, for studies of uh, antibiotic bi uh, antibody binding to microbiota by uh, basically being able to distinguish fungi from bacteria by their uh, bigger uh, cell size and unique presence of chitin in their cell wall, which we can visualize by staining, staining with, uh, 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 with uh, uh, calcofloor white. And from here, uh, it I could sort those uh, uh, fractions and we can use uh, deep sequencing technology to uh, basically uh, identify fungal, uh, to identify fungal identities of those organisms bound to either uh, systemically developing IgG antibodies or to locally produce secretory IgG antibodies. So using this multi-cap approach, uh, it I observed that systemic IgG antibodies to gut microbiota are present in mice uh, so uh, this is basically the situation when serum is added to the uh, fungal, uh, uh, to the fecal material, but those IgG antibodies are not present in the uh, lumen. Uh, in, in contrast, about 50% of the fungi in the gut are bound to secretory IgA, something that I will touch base at the end of my presentation. So this uh, phenomenon here became very uh, important. So we went further to investigate that. Uh, we found that uh, those antifungal systemic IgG antibodies are dependent on the presence of microbiota in the gut because they were lost in germ-free mice. 
and they are also developing in humans uh, with higher variability, of course, understandably between different uh, healthy subjects. But nevertheless, those antibodies exist also in the human serum. So the next question we ask is, what is the target of those antibodies? So we sorted different populations of IgG, IgA double positive fungi in the human feces, IgG double single positive fungi, and fungi that didn't bind uh, to any uh, antibodies. And we proceeded with uh, deep sequencing. So what became very uh, clear and interesting here is that a lot of those uh, both IgG a and IgG antibodies are binding uh, differentially and specifically to Kendau because there is binding also to other uh, fungi, but it's uh, not uh, uh, there is no uh, differential preference, or there are fungi that are not bound by, by those antibodies. And similar phenomenon occurs uh, in this uh, single positive IgG population. So uh, fungi are uh, bound uh, by those antibodies and specific fungal species of Kendau because are the ones that are preferentially bound by those antibodies, phenomenon that we basically validated with ELISA using uh, uh, th uh, th th those uh, specific fungal cells as antigens. So uh, are those antibodies actually induced by uh, specific gut fungi? So we went to use a Jeffrey mouse model where we colonize with different fungi uh, identified by the multi-cap uh, uh, assay and found that Kendall because was the one that induced highest titers of those IgG antibodies in the serum. And more importantly, those antibodies were binding with uh, high preference for Kendall because uh, there was lower cross-reactivity with other gut fungi. So uh, can the obicans is both a target and also an inductor of those antibodies. What is the function of those antibodies? So patients that undergo different procedures leading to uh, global immunosuppression are at high risk of disseminated fungal infections. And the gut is often the source, especially if this, those infections are caused by candida. This was shown uh, very nicely in recent works from Andrew Cohen to Bias Hollow's labs. So we use a model developed uh, by Andrew Koch where uh, basically uh, gut disseminated fungal candidiasis is induced by immunosuppression with cyclophosphamide. What we observe here, in addition to what was described already for as a severe neutropenia, is that those antifungal, anti candal become specific antibodies were decreased upon induction of immunosuppression. So we generated those antibodies against different fungal specificities in germ-free mice and adoptively transfer them in mice in this model. So what we observed was that anti-candida albicans antibodies could protect those mice from both uh, dead and uh, uh, systemic dissemination. But uh, antibodies raised against Saccharomyces cerevisiae didn't provide such protection. And we have been exploring uh, specificities and cross-reactivity of those antibodies, which is another topic that I will not discuss today. So how are those antifungal IgG antibodies generated? Uh, we colonized microbiota deficient mice with Kendall-Bicans or Saccharomyces cerevisiae and uh, looked at uh, class switch recombination events in gut uh, associated lymphoid tissues or distal tissues. So if we colonize with Kendall, because no such event uh, happened in uh, pyrus patches on mesenteric lymph nodes, but uh, that was uh, significantly inducing a, a gut distal organ such as the spleen. And uh, we further detected a uh, uh, germinal center B cell reaction uh, in the spleen upon intestinal colonization with Kendall, because, but not with Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Uh, and uh, I will not go through that data, but that was not due to the systemic spread of Kenda from the gut uh, to uh, distal organs. And we checked that uh, up to four weeks after intestinal colonization. But rather, we found fungal DNA, fungal antigens uh, that are transferred from the gut to the spleen of the mice, suggesting that this process is uh, involved in the induction of those antibodies. So what are the, the other mechanisms that are uh, involved in those antibody induction uh, this study? So in a parallel project, we were looking at CAR9 as uh, uh, the, the only human genetic uh, deficiency that is associated specifically with severe uh, local or systemic fungal infections, but not with bacterial viral infections. 
Uh, and in a collaboration with Anne Puel, uh, we identified that in patients undergo, uh, who, who were systemically infected with candida, uh, systemic candidiasis patients, basically uh, a CAR9 deficiency led to decrease of antifungal antibodies. So what is this uh, innate, uh, this molecule that is uh, strictly basically uh, 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 investigated in the sense of innate immunity it has to do with, uh, with adaptive and humoral immunity. So in mice we, that we infected with uh, a Kendall because we observed very similar phenomenon. CAR9 mice were not able to induce uh, IgG systemic antibodies against Candida. And uh, this was also dependent on loss of uh, uh, germinal center uh, B cells and induction of class switch recombination in specifically in CAR9 knockout mice. So uh, we linked uh, all this process to a CAR9. But again, uh, how, how is that involved to uh, humoral immunity when CAR9 is known to be, be expressed in uh, uh, in, uh, in cells of the innate immune system. And we confirmed that uh, using uh, previously generated single cell RNA uh, seq da data set. So in the human intestine, monocyte, macrophages, and dendritic cells are the only cells that express CAR9 in addition to neutrophils, which, we, uh, which uh, are lost basically when this processing is done. Uh, so we knock out the, uh, the, uh, the mouse analog of those cells uh, in mice, and so that uh, depletion of CAR9 positive cx 3 cr one positive microphages in mice leads to decrease of uh, a germinal center uh, response and class switch recombination of IgG positive B cells in the splints of those mice upon Kenta colonization in the gut. But uh, this, this effect was not, uh, this phenomenon was not observed when we knock out uh, CDC2s in those mice, suggesting that uh, the uh, gut specific members of the gut microbiota are targeting distal uh, mechanisms of, uh, uh, of, of antifungal uh, antigen uh, specific antibody uh, production. And this is uh, dependent on both specific population of phagocytes and T cells data that I didn't go through today. So this is enriching the systemic antifungal IgG antibody pool and uh, leads to uh, uh, circulating antibodies that are protective in mouse models. Uh, humans that are deficient in CAR9 uh, uh, are losing this uh, mechanism. So uh, this is about uh, uh, those antibodies that are uh, circulating systemically. But how about the IgA antibodies that I showed you are actually coating about 50% uh, of the fungi in both mouse and human gut. So I will not have time to really go through that. And it's a lot of unpublished data that uh, also I will not discuss probably in an open forum, but happy to discuss that later with, uh, with you if uh, somebody's interested offline. Uh, so what we found was that those uh, uh, secretory IgA antibodies that are produced specifically in the gut, they also target Kendall because, but they're targeting very specific morphology in Kendall because, and this is hypho and the pseudo hypho morphology. So we have been going under, after specific factors here and, uh, and processes that are very important uh, in the gut. So uh, I will conclude that uh, with, with our current view of uh, how those uh, uh, things are going. So basically those systemic IgG antibodies are, uh, are induced by intestinal fungi and, and they have some function in systemic immunity and are probably a messenger and in their inductors of processes that are important for uh, if systemic fungal infection uh, occurs. Uh, uh, on the other end, those secretory Ig antibodies that are produced specifically in the gut, they have actually a local effect. And we're, we have been exploring that in the sense of uh, fungal commensalism, a topic that we are very much interested in. With that, I would like to acknowledge uh, uh, the people in the lab that uh, were dedicated to those studies. And today I presented work uh, done specifically by Tai Duron, Irina Leonardi, Shin Lee, Alexa Simon, Agnieszka Barr. And uh, I, I gave some introduction to projects uh, done by other people in the lab, but didn't go into that direction. A lot that 
uh, of course, that could not happen uh, without uh, all that uh, great network of uh, international and, uh, and local collaborators that we have here uh, also in New York. And uh, uh, without all that funding that sponsored those efforts. Uh, with this, I would like uh, uh, to thank you. And uh, I think we'll go uh, with uh, questions here. Again, thank you very much. A fascinating study of, of something which um, literally affects everybody in the audience uh, in a direct way. Um, so we are now going to go to questions. Uh, I'll be joined with Geraldine for this session. And we will uh, ask questions which, which we're receiving. Uh, please do continue to submit them in the Q&A panel. Uh, we will uh, try to ask questions where they come together uh, collectively or we'll consolidate some questions. Just to remind you, we, we will get through everything we possibly can during the session. Um, so um, if I may start with a question um, to you, Ilian, um, and this is a, um, a practical question about doing this. When you study a gut microbiome, are you st studying sampling feces directly from the intestines taken locally? Are the, uh, how important is the sampling method, the way in which you get these very diverse populations of microbes, including fungi in the, in the, in the microbiome? Oh, you're mute, um, Eliane. Yeah, this is a great question. So uh, depends on the question, uh, basically. So we are exploring both mucosa associated and, uh, and uh, luminal fungi. So in the methodologies that I showed you, we have been using basically uh, the pool of the feces because that's actually uh, easier to collect. Uh, we can go with bigger populations and we can study in the same time uh, commensal fungi and uh, dietary fungi, which I haven't actually gone through in this uh, presentation, but they're important in other processes. Uh, if we go to specific diseases uh, that are targeting the gut mucosa, we are going very specifically to mucosa-associated fungi. Some of those methodologies work for mucosa-associated fungi, others do not. So you have to be very uh, specific what methodology you're using in one or in the other situation. So that all that has to be tailored dependent on the question. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, I'm going to combine a couple of questions for Leia about the NPBTA and GLIN4. So firstly, um, what's the therapeutic index of NPBTA? And does it affect human translation? And on the other side, the fact that you can get mutations in GLIN4 that uh, make it resistant, does that raise concerns for using the molecule as, as a therapeutic. And I think that applies to, to other molecules, not just NPBTA. Absolutely, so fantastic question. So uh, the first piece is uh, the NPBTA <laughs> does uh, affect human translation as well, we think. We haven't yet done all the translation assays, uh, but we expect that it may do so. We do know in cell culture uh, that we can rescue the human cells with no toxicity. So we think that there is some selectivity there that allows us to, to move this forward. The molecule itself coming from the deck has, has some metabolic liabilities. So it's not suitable for use in vivo. So we can't yet move it forward into an animal model. So it would require considerable optimization. We think that there's uh, real potential for improving fungal selectivity. Uh, and that is generally always required as part of any, any program to really move a molecule forward. So we think we need to improve fungal selectivity uh, in doing so, maintaining, of course, sort of potency and potentially even improving potency uh, and addressing any pharmacological liabilities. So we think that that's uh, a really key part. And resistant mutations can arise, absolutely. And yes, that's a very important consideration. And we kind of have this paradox, right, where uh, it's always easiest to identify the target of molecules for which you can get resistant mutations, right, that confer resistance, but then those have a reliability or a vulnerability to resistance. So what we tend to do is really to explore the potential for that is to look at the fitness cost of, of resistance. So resistance can often arise. Uh, we look, for example, at amplotericin. We know that there's all kinds of mutations in the ergosterol pathway that result in substitution of an alternate sterol in the membrane. If there's no ergosterol, 
uh, amphotericin doesn't doesn't work. It doesn't bind and extract the sterol. So you confer resistance. But if over 50 years of use, the, there's been very little widespread resistance uh, resistance to the, the polyenes. And that's largely because those resistance mutations are associated with a very severe fitness cost. So those mutants don't proliferate and spread. Um, they're very vulnerable to, to stresses in the host and elsewhere. So we think a key part is looking at the, the vulnerability to resistance for sure. Uh, but part of that has to be then looking at the fitness consequences and just assessing whether that's uh, a real liability. Another strategy that we often use is even if a molecule has single agent activity, one way to sort of minimize the potential of resistance is to use combinations, right? So if you use two bioactive molecules together that have a, either a synergistic effect, uh, you then require multiple mutations to really confer resistance, right? And, and that can then minimize the chance of resistance. So I think there's stewardship strategies uh, that we can explore uh, to further in, in enhance uh, resistance evasive therapeutics as we design these molecules moving forward. Thanks. Ilian, um, you've shown in your presentation that Candida albicans is the inductor and the target of these IgGs. The question is, do you think you could use those antibodies therefore prophylactically to protect patients from risk of infection? Yeah, so, so that's a one, uh, so, so that's something that we explore basically in the, in the mouse models. Uh, and depends uh, depends basically how how you go about it. So there, of course, uh, ideas that this can be achieved. Uh, the question is how much we learn about the specificity and how much uh, specificity versus cross reactivity you need to actually achieve a ther therapeutic result. So we have been looking now at uh, the specificities of those antibodies because we know uh, they have some level of cross reactivity as well although not to the species that I showed here, but for example, if we uh, use them in a model of uh, Kendoris systemic infection, they would protect partially uh, against uh, lethal effects. So uh, what level of cross-reactivity and specificity do you, do you need actually for systemic protection? And vice versa, if you go in the gut and you focus more on, uh, on the secretory antibodies there on IgAs, uh, it's a very similar question that we are also exploring there. So what is actually needed to be targeted to basically foster commensalism versus, uh, uh, versus uh, patobiont lifestyle? Thank you very much. Okay. Leia, do we still have you? We may have lost, no, she's back. Sorry, I'm here, right. multitasking. Yeah, <laughs> fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so the ABC molecule from the lactobacillus, you, you used, your readout was filamentation. So does it have any other effect on fungal cells? Um, yeah, that's yeah. interesting. So we, we don't see general growth inhibition. So we know lactobacillus produce all kinds of molecules, including lactic acid, which does inhibit candida growth. So that was part of our triaging process was figuring out uh, what this molecule was doing. The effect seems pretty specific uh, to filamentation. Um, that said, we haven't done like a huge phenotypic compendium of, of, uh, of assays to look at uh, what it might be doing in, in other contexts. It doesn't inhibit growth in rich medium for sure, and that makes sense with the target. So if we delete YAK1, for example, uh, there's no fitness defect in rich medium. But we do note that YAK1 may be important for sort of alternative carbon source utilization and all kinds of other phenotypes. So we think that we might be able to uncover some additional uh, phenotypic effects of our molecule. Uh, we think that there's going to be uh, some really neat strategies. Given the role in filamentation, it seems to be important for biofilm formation, uh, for mucosal infections, uh, and, and all kinds of other contexts. So we think there's, there's great potential. In terms of if it has any effect on human cells, uh, so the, the molecule ABC itself, interestingly, is metabolized by human cells. So uh, it goes away <laughs> very quickly. So it doesn't, but not because the, the compound is not, but because the compound uh, is, is labile. So it's metabolized by uh, hepatocytes, for example. So we have looked uh, and done some SAR, uh, structure activity relationships, and found uh, some analogs of the same scaffold uh, that um, 
are not metabolically labile in the same way. And there's there's a number of beta carbolines, including harmine, for example, uh, and others that have been in uh, in development for, for other indications. So we do know they have anti-proliferative activity. Mm. They also have uh, biogenic activity, so they can modulate sort of depression and other related phenotypes. Uh, so we think that there's, there's some interesting potential. We can leverage uh, some medicinal chemistry that's been done uh, in, in response to other indications to advance the the platform. ABC won't be the lead molecule. That is the bio, you know, microbiome derived compound. Uh, but we think it's going to require a bit of optimization for, for true delivery as a therapeutic. So does that mean it's restricted to candida albicans then if it's, it works against filamentation? So, you know, in, in principle, candida albicans filamentation is, is clearly a, a key uh, virulence trait in that context. But we note that YAK1 has been shown to be important for virulence traits in cryptococcus uh, and in aspergillus and in other species. So we think actually the target itself has very important roles in multiple virulence traits, including cell wall stress. Uh, so I think it actually is going to be a broader strategy, but the filamentation specific effect may be, may be albican specific. Okay. Ilian, um, question here, noting that candida albicans causes more damage than other candida species, and that you've shown um, that the, there's a um, specific induction of secretor IgA by hyphae. The question is, is this correlated? Is the damage correlated because it is targeting hyphae more specifically? So is that... Yeah, that, that might be involved in the local circuit uh, in the gut, but uh, in terms of uh, systemic uh, immune response, and we have been exploring that in terms of antibodies and also in terms of uh, immunity to gut distal sites that is antibody independent in some uh, situations as the uh, gut lung access uh, and allergy. So some of the effects are not related uh, to that damaging program while others are. So, uh, uh, so, so something that we still are exploring and we, uh, we have to learn more about is basically how the fungal antigens that we find uh, into this in the spleen are actually getting there so do you need actually a damage do you need a uh, basically a transport of those antigens by specific cells or is that a passive uh, way of getting those antigens uh, to the site of uh, uh, igg of a b cell class switch recombination induction uh, to basically induce those responses. So it's a very complex question if you actually go and explore this uh, pathway specifically. So it will take probably a couple of years to learn more about that site. Can I link that to another question which was asked, which is, therefore, have you tested the production of IgA and IgG antibodies when you colonize the gut of the mouse with a yeast lot mutant of candida? So we, we are exploring that. Uh, so uh, it's a work in progress uh, for in, in a, so it's a different pathways that are actually uh, targeted to induce the IG antibodies or to induce the systemic IgG antibodies. So in one pathway, the uh, is log form uh, basically uh, is not inducing antibodies in the other, it does. So it's more, uh, that, that's why we have to learn more about those intermediate steps of each pathway to really pinpoint the precise mechanism and decouple one from the other. Thank you, Ilian. Le, have you identified um, any compounds with which antagonize the activity of clinical antifungals. And maybe they'd be useful to help um, understand resistant mechanisms. That's an interesting point. We haven't really done our screens in the way that would be optimized to pull out those kinds of molecules. Uh, so we're often using a very low concentration of a, the classic antifungal uh, to then look for molecules that enhance that activity. So as such, you're not really, really well positioned to look for those that um, enhance resistance because you're only having a very modest growth inhibition with the antifungal alone. Uh, you could certainly do those screens and in the pooled formats, you can pull it out quite easily because with a pooled format, you can very easily find mutants that have reduced uh, fitness or enhanced fitness specific to the compound. So it is an interesting strategy to pull out resistance modulators. 
Uh, I don't think we have extensive data to speak to that, but I note that in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, yeah, there's large uh, compendia of these, these data sets, at least for haploinsufficiency profiling. So looking at reduced dosage uh, and whether that confers hypersensitivity or in principle uh, resistance, and you can mine those data uh, to your heart's desire uh, through multiple different databases. So I think it's a good, good way to generate some hypotheses. We find that there's lots of differences uh, in terms of bioactivity of molecules between uh, Candida, Aspergillus, Cryptococcus, and Saccharomyces. So it's, I think, hypothesis generating. Um, but we certainly know that, you know, all the classic antifungals that we use, uh, many of them have conserved modes of action like azoles, uh, kinagandins, polyenes, all of which uh, there have been studies in service yet that have been very informative. Thanks. Eliane, this next question, I loved your talk and also your clock. I think it means the clock behind you, which must have fallen <laughs> off the wall at some stage. <laughs> Anyway, the question that they ask is about the location of the fungi uh, in the gut. Are there more species in the ileum compared with the colon? And if so, does the colon mucus layer have any impact on the microbiodiversity? Yeah, that's a very complex question. So we are investigating that uh, at the moment. Uh, so well, in terms of biomass, we detect higher biomass in the colon, but uh, that can be due to a few different uh, uh, physiological aspects of how the gastrointestinal tract is working. Uh, another hypothesis can be that the, because the environment also in the colon is very different. Uh, the other hypothesis could be here that this environment is actually uh, propelling the survival of uh, specific fungi in one side and uh, survival of other fungi in the other side. So. Uh, sequencing data, and we have done that uh, in different dimensions in the gastrointestinal tract in different sites. So that data suggests that indeed some fungi are more prevalent in one versus the other side. So now how those things are working during uh, diseases that we are interested in is another question that is very interesting because then you have actually uh, loss of uh, intestinal integrity and that and that is site specific. So many times you can actually explore uh, material from that side, but you are not able to explore also the surrounding material or you know the mucosa versus feces. So it's kind of a complex, uh, a complex question to answer. Uh, but uh, for some species, for some reason, the, the, the colon is actually a site where they, they're found more commonly and where they thrive during inflammatory conditions, especially commensal species. Thank you. Leah, do you, do you have a rationale or how do you decide which library compound co uh, to screen against which species? Yeah, that's a great question. So we, we have quite a few libraries that we've worked with, probably like 10 different different libraries. Uh, and part of it depends on accessibility. So some of those libraries we have in-house. Uh, and so those are great, uh, great for all kinds of different reasons where we can do the kinds of screens we want. Some of them are we don't have in-house. And so we, an example being uh, the library that led to the identification of the GLN-4 inhibitor was at the Riken Institute in Japan. Uh, so that we worked uh, in collaboration with uh, Charlie Boone, who's got a, a lab and an outpost in, in Japan, and two of my graduate students uh, went over there and had an you know, incredible time and, and uh, did some great screening and then went back for some additional, additional analyses. Uh, so, you know, in this era, that would be tricky. <laughs> so it depends on uh, accessibility of the libraries. Um, we have great, you know, chemistry collaborators. We've done some screens with Stuart Schreiber uh, and his diversity-oriented synthesis collection. That was partnership with Joe Heitman as well, who I know is, is on the call here, uh, as well as Bill Steinbeck. So I think it depends in part on, you know, accessibility of the library, but fundamentally, different kinds of molecules may have different bioactivities, but also the, the screen that you use is key to, you know, what you look for is what you're going to find on some, some level. So we find that natural product compounds often have great permeability at getting into cells since they're sort of optimized by nature to do that and have those kind of bioactivities. But sometimes they can be more tricky uh, for figuring out mode of action. So I think it just depends uh, on, on the project. Having good chemistry collaborators is really key to be able to move forward these kinds of programs because the, the screen is sort of step one on a, on a long journey. Then it's figuring out mode of action and almost always considerable optimization of the molecule for the, the kinds of properties we talked about. <laughs> 
Elaine, if I may, I'm going to try and combine two questions and the common denominator is a human diet. So the question is, uh, do you see uh, the impact of vegetarian diets or, or other obvious nutritional influences, hospital patients who have to have liquid diets, for example, uh, combined with the question of what about mushrooms in our diets? And, and indeed, I might throw in mycoprotein, corn, etc., noting that mushrooms contain many tremendous numbers of spores uh, and, their and are there signatures of immune responses to these other passengers through the gut? Yeah, so yeah, we sequenced a lot of samples and observed very interesting things. Uh, so for sure, we can detect different uh, dietary fungi uh, in, uh, and not only us, you know, the, the, there was this uh, study that was done years ago in the Broad Institute, one of the first one that showed, for example, you know, vegan that uh, were consuming a plant diet, uh, they could detect actually plant fungi uh, in, uh, in, in their samples. So we can observe something very similar here. Uh, so are those fungi really having any, so, so we could actually detect mushrooms as well uh, in few instances. Uh, so, so is any of that having any immune effect? Uh, it's very hard to tell. Uh, we've done experiments on a dietary fungi. We are working in that direction, but it's more uh, into the sense of how, uh, how those are impacting the microbiome. Some of them don't, even in germ-free mice, they don't induce any response. So I would guess uh, many of those uh, dietary fungi, unless there is a toxin or something that directly uh, is sensed uh, is bad, those fungi otherwise will not induce an immune response directly. Uh, but uh, we are sampling them, we are studying them because they are interested from another perspective, not really direct induction of immunity. Thank you. I'm, I'm, if I may, I might link that. There's another question is just speculating why you think that some species which are still represented in high numbers, they could be transitory or part of the microbiota, why are they failing to induce such high teeters of antibodies? Well, I think uh, those antibodies has a lot to do with commensalism. Uh, so if we are, and we are seeing that, so in humans it's harder to do because it's a cross-sectional analysis, but in mice you can do different time points. And if an organism is adapted to be a commensal and persists and, uh, uh, and actually, uh, is inducing uh, responses that we can detect on innate and on the adaptive immune side. Those are the organisms that are actually leading to, res uh, to response against uh, themselves. And, uh, and uh, you know, that concept is not foreign on, in the bacterial world either. So you would actually have a response to specific commensals. You would not have any response to, uh, to basically organisms that are introduced by the diet. And that was a big struggle of the probiotic field actually to emerge in the, in the 80s and 90s when the immunology was developing. But uh, you know, there was actually, wasn't actually any meaningful response to those organisms when you, when you eat yogurt and uh, stuff like that. So you know, commensalism is a very big factor and that might be an evolving uh, relationship. That's why we think it's so interesting that uh, humans have those antibodies, you know, walking humans that never, uh, that, that are not actually sick and uh, that are exposed to those organisms and probably carry them in the gut. Thank you. So they, you showed that 40% of candida genes don't have a direct homologue in SRBCA and four of those are essential. So do you think that essential genes are underrepresented in among candida genes that don't have a direct homologue? Not necessarily. We, we've looked at this so many ways that, that <laughs> it's, it's hard to, to, to give you a really clear answer. But no, I mean, overall, we think that there's a, a, a reasonable, like the service CA data was one of the best predictors. So although it was only 52.4%, it was one of the, the drivers. The other one was uh, features from Judy Berman's transposon mutant collection for which there were six features that were extracted uh, from her data set. So those were the two strongest drivers. 
uh, in terms of being able to predict essentiality was whether the service data orthologs were essential or if there were paralogs, the paralogs were synthetic lethal, or if Judy's Berman's analysis also supported sort of an essential call based on the haploid uh, transposon analysis. So overall, there's there's reasonable correlation, uh, and and we think that there's a few points to keep in mind. So one is we're using one strain, right? And so we do know that there's genetic background context, and if we take a sort of population level approach, we know that there's genetic interactions in the genome, and so different strains have different constellations of phenotypes and SNPs that may may affect um, outcome. The other, of course, is how you measure essentiality. So we used a very strict measure of essentiality. So we grew the strains with, uh, this is a conditional expression system, doxycycline to repress transcription. Um, and because of the sort of potential for uh, reduced transcriptional repression, uh, we used a very stringent cutoff. So our call was it had to be virtually completely unable to grow uh, to call it as essential. We do have the data so we can say, uh, do some of the strains just have fitness defects rather than you know an inability to grow. But so depending on how you quantify uh, or classify essential genes, then you can you know, significantly shift uh, the outcome of your analysis. Another point that's really interesting is every approach to study essential genes has different strengths and weaknesses. And so one thing that's becoming uh, quite clear is that with the conditional expression system, it's a very powerful way uh, to, to look at essential genes. And it's got sort of like a built-in complementation because you can make sure that the phenotype is really specifically associated with reducing expression of the, the gene of interest, right? So it's, it's a great way you just remove the docs you can restore expression and make sure your phenotype goes away and then you have a nice uh, link between the phenotype and that gene of interest but we've looked very closely at how uh, effective transcriptional repression is across different gene expression levels so as we know genes in the genome are expressed at you know a huge range of, of different levels and what we're finding which is very similar to what has been found by charlie boone and others in saccharomyces cerevisiae is that the systems, conditional expression systems in general work very beautifully for genes that are reasonably strongly expressed, but for genes that are very lowly expressed, conditional expression systems aren't great. So we can have high confidence in genes that we determine are essential from our analysis. We have great confidence, but if the gene is classified as non-essential, if it's lowly expressed, we have very weak power uh, to support that analysis. Um, and that's common with the estradiol system used for Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Uh, so it's not specific to the, the TET-OFF system. Uh, it's a general conditional expression system. So I think as the field moves more to sort of sophisticated analyses of essential genes, we're gonna need to have a bit of a, you know, a portfolio of different kinds of approaches that we can use depending on the, you know, the expression level and potentially the genomic context. Okay. Liam, this next question may sit somewhat between the two talks we had with Leah's and your own. Um, the question is, how does the gut microbiota shape candida host interactions, especially the hyphae antagonizing species? Does it shape, for example, I presume the, the, rich, the, 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 the IgG, IgA ratio? Well, there, there, a lot, there is a lot of literature on that side. So, uh, so, so there are different ways how, uh, you know, fungi that are commensal, but also uh, pathobionts in a situation, in a, some sense, uh, expand during decrease of diversity. And that's because of multiple mechanisms, as uh, many groups have shown. Uh, it can be uh, because there is an opening in the niche. So uh, uh, those fungi are taking actually opportunity and, uh, and grow there. Uh, there, uh, there is also host related mechanism as Andrew Koch has very elegantly shown how basically uh, specific uh, bacterial species uh, from, the, uh, from bacteroiditis can induce uh, antimicrobial peptides, and those pepti antimicrobial peptides are actually preventing kind of overgrowth. So if those species and the diversity in that group is basically decreased, you have expansion. So there are multiple mechanisms that are playing uh, a tool here. So, so that's how we are, so, so it's very complex to even model those situations. That's why we are using a combination of germ-free mice, uh, defined microbiota uh, models. I didn't introduce all of that. I went through the talk and I kind of simplified all the story a lot. So I see it actually in a couple of more questions here. I probably oversimplified, but, uh, but all those are taking place. So to understand which mechanism is important in a situation, you have to have a, a model, specific modeling of this situation. So we are looking at some uh, 
and some organisms that have uh, properties to basically exclude uh, or suppress the growth of specific uh, uh, fungi in the gut. Uh, not to the extent that Lear is doing that. Of course, we are not specialized in that area, but uh, from, you know, from the po point of view of uh, uh, mucosal immunologists, how you think about that and how that is influencing the global immunity. So we are modeling that in, in, in we, to, to have an answer, we have to go into specific situations basically because uh, those things are interconnected. Um, Leia, does NPBTA inhibit the cervicia gland for us? Is something very different about the Candidorus sequence? It does. Yeah, it does. So that was one of the ways in which we actually led to focus in on that, that compound. Because when I think I mentioned we did this sort of screen of 10,000 compounds, we found more than just the one. Uh, but we wanted to really effectively link uh, the small molecule screening to one of our essential genes as a sort of proof of concept to tie those two approaches together. So one of the fun projects you can do is just mine some of the available service AI, uh, HIP, haploinsufficiency profiling databases. Uh, and then you can see, you know, for all of the thousands of compounds that have been profiled, you know, what genes come up as, as clear hits for a specific compound. There's also, of course, things called frequent flyers, which are genes that, that are, you know, coming up with multiple compounds. So those would be mutants that are hypersensitive to lots of things like efflux related genes, membrane uh, related genes, for example. But we found uh, from cervicii, sort of the first clue that it looked like that compound uh, had been assayed by others and that compound um, uh, had the most potent activity against a, a GLIN4 heterozygous mutant. So that's what led us to sort of really have laser focus in on that particular compound and do all the genetic dosage analysis in cervicii, uh, as well as a translation inhibition assay using that sort of fluorescent reporter assay that, that I showed for the rocaglates. Uh, and we have biochemical assays underway right now in collaboration with Jerry Wright's lab. Okay, so so you that's I think you're addressing one of the other questions about whether you have any pharmacokinetic analysis with MPBTA. So I think we've done enough to know that that there's metabolic liabilities that preclude really using using this compound. Uh, so we're we're focused on uh, we know there's a number of things to improve. We need to address the metabolic liabilities as well as uh, we want to further sort of improve fungal selectivity. I think as as key points. Ilian, uh, again, I'll try and combine two uh, questions here about IgA and um, gut anatomy. So first of all, is there a gradient of IgA in the intestinal lumen versus the mucosa? And um, wait a minute, I, the other question was, um, are there specific areas of IgA production, for example, in the pyres patches? rather than the spleen, IgG. Yeah, so, so, so there is a gradient of Ig uh, production and that has been very well described. Uh, we see something similar in sense of uh, antifungal IgAs, but uh, uh, so, so the, the processes in the pyrus patches have been very well investigated. So that's one mechanism of uh, induction, but there are other mechanisms that are not related specifically to the pyrus patches or might be related uh, indirectly uh, that are also involved and that can actually influence uh, how the production is happening and where it is happening. So that, those are very interesting questions to answer in very novel directions, basically, how that those responses are regulated at different sites. And it's not really, uh, you know, that much directed towards the IGA only, but also about the mechanism. How is that happening? And that's where it's very important also to learn how uh, specific fungi against which those antibodies responses are induced behave in a different compartment. Uh, so, so those things are linked and we are uh, working on them from different angles because you need at least uh, three or four different angles in my mind to really come up with an answer. So that's what we are trying to do here in that sense. Okay, I think we're running out of time, um, but maybe the last question for Leah. Um, so you've you've looked at um, the ABC compounds inhibiting yeast to hyphal switch. Have you ever considered species that do it the other way around? So hyphal to yeast like Ashbury or Aspergillus or Mucor, would you see an inhibition of that? That's a 
It's a good question. Uh, we have not uh, done any assays with aspergillus or mucor yet, um, but I, I think it's a it's a great idea. We do know just based on mining the literature for the role of Yak One, which is at least the established target in Canada, Albicans. We know that you know the Yak One homologue called Yak A uh, is essential for morphogenesis in the filamentous fungus Penicillium marneferi. So there's there's certainly potential for roles in morphogenesis in filamentous fungi. Uh, so we'd be really keen to do so. We we have aspergillus sort of, uh, in house that we can work with. We haven't done any work with mucor in house. So maybe I'll I'll call up some of my friends who are on this call and, and uh, send them some ABC and we can uh, get that tested for everyone here. That'll be great. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I think that we're right at the end now. So I'd like to thank um, both the speakers. There are a few questions remaining. They can be answered offline um, if, if you wish. And the talks will be available. Um, the recordings will be available uh, on the website. So thanks to my co-chair, Neil. And thanks very much to Leia and to Ilian. I think they were fantastic talks. Yes. Yes. Thanks fantastic. so much, everyone. Thank you very much, everybody. And thanks, everybody, for asking questions. Take care.